All right, we should be live now. Welcome everyone, my name is Mark Hughes. I'm here on behalf of Advanced Assembly and Royal Circuit Solutions. And we're here for a tech chat with Mike Yopi or Jopi. I mean, you can pronounce it however you want. Mike's too polite to say anything. Uh, <laughs> Mike's joined us a, a couple years back, uh, not years, but months back. And we were talking about thermal design because he is something of an expert in the area. He literally wrote the standard IPC 2152. I mean, it's all his data, all his hard work and research. And that led to a hack chat over at hackaday.com, which then brings us back to today. So Mike, maybe give us a little history about what we're talking about today and uh, what we're gonna what we're gonna do. Sounds good. Well, first off, a lot of people contributed to IPC 2152. I did put in a, a big chunk in the very beginning, but there was a large team of people that came together, not only for writing the standard, but also manufacturers that help build boards for us that uh, well, more than uh, myself and my company uh, did testing. It just turned out that the test results from the work that my company did turned out to be the uh, data set of choice. Uh, so we had this hack chat that you helped to inspire. And on HackChat, I don't know how many people are aware of how HackChat works, but you're just typing and getting uh, messages from people through your online screen, and it's all, all typing, no video, audio type uh, interface. So there's a, a gentleman that's working on his PhD, I assume in electrical engineering, that had a problem where he was, uh, he's, he had four MOSFETs on a, on a board and each dissipating 15 watts. So he had 60 watts of power on this board. And he had a question about how to uh, design the thermal vias for those packages. And uh, right off the bat, 60 watts of power on a board is a lot of power. And the uh, extremes that you have to go through to manage that power uh, are all dependent upon what the application of that electronics turns out to be and how it's mounted and what it's mounted to. And uh, it was just too difficult to ask all of those questions, uh, not to mention just the electronics package that he was dumping this 15 watts into each one of them. MOSFETs, you know, in my past, you know, they're designed to handle a lot of power, but, you know, <laughs> The, the manufacturers of the components, they guarantee that they, the package can handle it, but what you do with it after that, once you mount it to a board, is it's, it's all on you. And it's not a simple problem. And so I reached out to uh, Dan Maloney. Am I pronouncing that right? Mm -hmm. And I asked him to put me in contact with this gentleman uh, that was working on his PhD. And he's in Germany. And so Dan reached out to him to allow me to communicate with him so that I could give him a little bit more information that I was able to help him with on that hack chat. And so what I'd like to do, what, what brought us together again here is to go over some of the tools that I sent to him to help him work through his problem. And the primary part of that is just this little calculator I put together in Excel I mean, it's just, this isn't a software product by any means. It's a tool that, you know, I built tools for the work that I would do when I was a thermal analyst out in the industry. And I built tools for every little kind of problem that I saw as something that would be repetitive. So it would help me speed up my process of design uh, as I run into these common problems. So the main thing that I want to show, you know, today and go over is this calculator for uh, sizing thermal vias and how I put to that together. And now, are you able to put that out there for people to download it? Sure, we can put that up at uh, royalcircuits.com forward slash blog. Um, I'll type that up and put it on the screen. It's not gonna be there yet, but I will send it off to my boss and we can put it up there. Cool. Yeah, the other part that's in, so I put a, a revisions page into it. So when I, would ever give something away. I always included a revisions page. And in there, if people make changes to it, all I ask is that you 
you know, document the changes you make to it. If you find an error, let people know you found an error, what the correction was that you made. And I also added uh, another uh, worksheet in there for calculating the power dissipation in electronic traces. And the, the cool thing about that calculator that I included is that it's got information in there that, uh, yeah, so there's the revision page. And we'll t if we have time, we'll, we'll go over this power calculator as well. But right here, you know, what I wanted to do is just provide a little bit of basics behind what the, uh, uh, basically the thermal via calculator was, was doing. And I did not add anything on the power calculator. That wasn't really the point of it, but I probably should have. Uh, so let's go over to that page with the design that Sven was working on. Yeah, so 60 watts um, is a ton of power. And we get all that through just ohmic heating inside the components, or is part of that generated inside the traces too? Do you know? It's just the component. Wow. Yeah, that's the part that... And so one of the things that I brought up with Sven was that he, he needs to consider the losses in the conductors as well. And you can see, I, I, you know, I, I, we didn't go over his design, but I look at this uh, little picture here and what it's just a, a small little screenshot of the design. And those white spaces that I put up there, those mm -hmm. four little white blocks are, are the outlines of the, the FETs, the MOSFETs. Okay. And those MOSFETs, <laughs> I'm surprised at how small a package is are, are made these days for handling this kind of power. It's just incredible to me that you can put this much power in this size package. And that package outline is six millimeters by five millimeters. And so for, for me, I have to convert that over to English units. And that's 0.2 inches by 0.24 inches. You know, it's, it's less than a quarter inch by quarter inch with 15 watts. That's a, so what I think about when I start seeing power, I also want to know what footprint that power is being dissipated over. And so what that brings to mind is power density. And that's one of the big things that I, I, I pushed and tried to collect a lot of data on when we were developing IPC 2152, is that you want to be not only cognizant of the power losses in your conductors, but also if you pay attention to the power density, there's a lot to learn. And I, I developed this uh, little software tool for looking at all of the data that we've collected. And power density is one of the, the pieces that I calculate when, when I use this tool and I dump it into a spreadsheet. I, I, I look at power, I look at current, I look at temperature rise, I look at the board configuration, how many copper planes are in it, all of the aspects of, and I was working on adding mounting configurations as well, because all of those things contribute to the, the overall heat transfer in, in the particular design. And mounting configurations sometimes have as much of an impact in terms of lowering temperature rise as the copper planes in the design do. Hmm. So looking at this board here, those four spots, they are so close together. Considering that those squares are 0.2 by 0.24 inches square, that means that they, they aren't any more than you know, 0.24 inches apart and the, on the large dimension and, and closer that maybe a tenth of an inch or less you know, from side to side. So you're not looking at 15 watts of power. You're looking at 60 watts of power in a very small area. That it's probably what three quarters of an inch by uh, a half inch that there that this design is trying to dump 60 watts of power in. So, so something that, the size of a of a quarter. Yeah, 60 watts, and it, it just that gets exciting for me. <laughs> <laughs> I love solving problems like this. <laughs> so, but Mike, let me let me ask you real quick. Um, you've got a different threshold from most engineers because you deal with space or you work with space systems. But at what point should my spidey senses start tingling? Um, at what power density? You know, do I need to start stopping what I'm doing and really start considering my power budget? 
I'm not my you know, pet, but my thermal. There's one more webinar I'd like to do with you, and that's to look at this calculator that I put together for looking at trace heating. Okay. And with that, we can get a, a sense of those kind of numbers because okay. it, it's too hard to throw out one number because everybody's design is different. The size of the boards are different. I was at a conference once, some guy came up to me and talked to me about a top secret design he was working on. Oh, no. And, uh, and I'm a little bit facetious about top secret there. Uh, but he was working for an industry uh, company that was, uh, so the way he described the problem it was a one inch cube. And he was going to be dissipating about a watt of power in that one inch cube. And I said, well, where's the energy going to go? And he goes, well, I don't know. And I said, well, if it's all by itself and it's dissipating one watt of power, it could just go to an infinite temperature with no energy loss. So you can't have energy in, you got to have energy out and you have to understand what that energy out is. And he couldn't describe it well enough for, for me to really help him. And I said, well, you just got to treat it as a, a control volume and you got to look at where, how the energy can get out of that little system. And then you can, from there, start to determine what kind of a temperature rise you have on your electronics. Well, in hindsight now, after time has passed and you see these little uh, plug-ins that you uh, plug into your wall socket and you put in your charger, you know, plug in, charge your phone. I think that's what they were. And in that case, had he been able to talk about it more, you've got a really good heat transfer path out of that little that cube to the wall socket, which is tied to copper wires that conduct that energy back through. And so that's the big heat sink in that design. That makes a lot of sense, Mike. Yeah, and it also makes a lot of sense that the engineers for a lot of these, you know, famous companies, you know, the Apples, the Teslas, the SpaceX, they never want you to know what they're doing or who they're working for. Their bosses have scared them so much that they can't ask the right questions. Yeah, and they, they're, they're afraid of IP concerns and losing their IP because people pick up on it so fast and they run with it so fast. It's amazing the development that can occur in a short period of time. True. And, that, and then it's their jobs that are on the hook. So I, yeah. I don't slight them for it, but you can only help so much when you have limited information. information. Yeah, absolutely. So back to these, you know, if you look at those white areas, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you can see underneath them. There's like, it looks like six vias underneath. I can. You know, and, and, and yeah, so I, I think those were the thermal vias that he had put into the design. So he had six uh, under each package and then an, an additional six there kind of in the middle off to the left. Yeah, those guys. Okay. Yeah. And so what I'd like to do is just look at how I put together a calculation for the thermal resistance in a thermal via. Sure. And then, you know, work that problem a little bit further and show how I worked through this to help uh, Sven just kind of think about a few other items in his design. Okay. So we've got 24, 30 vias in an area the size of a quarter, essentially, a yeah. little bigger, a little bigger. Yeah. Um, okay. So would you like me to pull up the next spreadsheet? Yeah, let's go to the calculator. All right. I know initially we wanted you driving today, but uh, technology just didn't want that to happen. That's all right. All right. So, so this is the spreadsheet that we will make available to people after the webinar. Cool. Now, I've, I've just thrown in some theoretical numbers. Uh, and what people are looking at here is on the left-hand side are the material properties. I'm just using copper uh I've got the thermal conductivity of FR4, polyimide, and an epoxy fill. And uh, I'm in, in the calculations, we can, uh, I believe I'm just working with FR4. And then down below that, I make the note that there's no radiation or convective losses. Uh, with one exception, there's a, and we'll, we'll talk about that. So here the goal is to have 15 watts of power the next line down under power is a junction to case. So the junction to case thermal resistance, there were actually two values for these MOSFETs, uh, 0.5 degrees C per watt and 0.9 degrees C per watt. And I've never, you know, it said typical for 
the typical is 0.5, but it could be as high as 0.9. And in design, you have to go with the worst numbers. You can, you can look at it and start weighing decisions by looking at what the typical values are, but you wouldn't want to start there. And then the next line down is the case to board thermal resistance. On his design, he, was, he has some thermal interface material that he was putting in to uh, provide a good heat transfer path between the case of the package and the board. And then uh, the next line down through board, so what I've done there, I, I've combined this, a few different calculations. That's actually, and I'll, I'll talk about that when we get a little further along, but it's basically looking at the thermal vias and the board material, but I don't separate the volume of the vias from the board material. It, it really doesn't matter too much in this particular case, but you can, it, it's probably good to assess those kind of differences to take that volume away if, if you're looking at a very specific design. And then the next slide down, the board to sink. So there's going to be, he's got a, what he was working on with this design is he wanted a convective heat sink, some kind of thinned arrangement on the bottom of the board that he was going to dump this energy to. And on any kind of heat sink like that, you have a thermal resistance between the board and whatever you're using, just like the component to the board, there's always a thermal resistance there. And, you know, so I, I don't know what that number was. One degree C per watt is a low number. It could very well be higher. And it, you just have to cross that bridge when you come to. I didn't know what kind of a heat sink he was using. I didn't have any information. I just do an optimistic number in there to, to make things look good. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> not a conservative approach, but you know, it, I think it's achievable. And then the next line down is conduct conduction through the sink. So when you've got a, a convective heat sink, some thin arrangement, the energy has to conduct up through it. And quite often they'll give you some kind of parameters that will take that into account. But I didn't know what that was, and I wanted to make sure that he was thinking about that when he was out selecting parts for his design. And so I just threw, again, a not necessarily conservative number, uh, the one degree C per watt, but I put something in there just to have a point of uh, something that would make him think about it. And then the sink to air, depending on uh, how that, that convective environment is, and this is, I, I colored that red because I say no radiation or convective losses, well, there would be convective losses off this heat sink, right? Mm -hmm. And if you had air blowing, then you'd also have convection off the board, most likely. And so the, the number there, the sink to air, would be from convection for this heat sink. And uh, so there is you know, that aspect of it. So there is convection in this problem, but it's just off the heat sink. And, uh, but I wanted to clarify that. Okay. And so when you stack that whole series, so that's like a, a series of resistors for your electrical analogy. And those, those resistors are all in series and that sums to 6.7 degrees C per watt. And so if you multiply the 15 watts by that total of 6.7, you come up with uh, a junction temperature further down there of 124.8 degrees C. So I'm assuming a 25 degree C ambient. If you click on the junction or the case temperature and then click up on the equation up in the function line, you can see what lines you know it's picking from. That that's much faster, Mike. Thank you. <laughs> I was highlighting them individually. No, there you go. And so yeah. that you know that's how the case temperature is calculated and also uh adding then the junction for the 124.8 uh, down below. So now let's go over to where I'm actually calculating the thermal resistance through the thermal vias. On the same slide? So or? It's, yep. So it's just the gray area. Got it. Okay. So we're just going to talk about the gray area now. And what I want to point out here is that the only thing that needs to be uh, touched here or edited are the red uh, items. 
So in this particular case, if we look at the red items in the middle, the board thickness is 0 0.06 inches thick. And, and that's a fairly standard board thickness, and that's what his is. And then I just picked an arbitrary uh, 10 mils for the outer diameter of the via. Okay. And, you know, this will, once I go through this, I'd like to, you and I to talk about, you know, what, what's a practical number of vias that you can put in. And we'll go down that road together a little bit after we go through this, okay? Absolutely, Mike. And I also want to touch on plating. So now I've, I've arbitrarily picked 0 0.01 inches for the OD. <clears throat> now the plating thickness, standard plating thickness in my realm is one mil. And probably more like seven tenths of a mil. Would you agree? I would absolutely agree. So would you change that three mils to, uh, let's just make it one mil for argument's sake. Got it. Cool. cool. And so that defines the inner diameter there. And also the number of vias, let's knock that number of vias. What did we see over there? There was about uh, 30. What? There were 30. Let's change that to 30. Okay. And in reality, we were looking at just one of, so let's just, let's start with six because there were six under each one of the packages. Got it. All right. So now if you go over and look at that junction temperature and case temperature, you can see that just for a single FET with 15 watts, you're a little bit, my, my highest junction temperature that I like to work with is about 125 C. I, and I didn't look up what the max junction on this FET is, but they typically are going to be around 125. Okay. Uh, gallium arsenide, they'll go up to maybe 150 or so, but I haven't touched those guys in a long time. I think 125 is reasonable. And you can see that that junction temperature calculation of 166 is a bit of an issue. That is pretty high. And when Sven ran his, uh, his design, he didn't tell me how many watts he could run, but he couldn't run uh, full 15 watts. So, uh, and he had a case temperature that he measured, I think with an infrared imager that showed that he had a case temperature of 125. So let's change our power over there, that 15 watts. Mm -hmm. uh, let's change it down to, I don't know, 10. See what that okay. does. Now, the, the thing is, I'm calculating the case temperature below the chip. And there's a different, and so with this component, uh, are, you're familiar with cavity up and cavity down, right? Yes, but our viewers probably aren't. So let's talk about that a little bit. So in this particular case, the cavity is up, which means that the the chip is mounted to some kind of substrate by a, you know, some kind of epoxy. And, and then that substrate is, is, might be mounted to a header and it might be mounted just to the case. But either way, the if you're looking at from the, the chip junction going down through the package, it's going right down toward the board. Whereas some packages, it'll be flip-flopped where that whole configuration would go up to the top of the case. And in, with this package, they have a different thermal resistance value for the junction to case if uh, you were, you know, if you wanted to have the top of the case. And that thermal resistance is much higher. And I think it was about 20, but I, I'd have to look it up. We might have it on that other page. Let's back up a little bit and just see if it's there so we can use that. I, Apologize for not looking that up before. No, Mike, it's it's fine. And I know you expect you to be driving today. Scroll down just a little bit. It's right below there. So yeah, so 20. Okay, the thermal resistance junction to case top. See that in the middle there on the left-hand side? Mm -hmm. So 20 degrees C per watt is the thermal resistance from the junction to the top of the case where he was measuring. So let's go back to that, that page, put in 20 and see... What that, yeah, put in 20 for that junction to case number. Yep. And yeah, yeah. So uh, 
what we have to do now is bump up. I don't think that he really saw 310 degrees C. So <laughs> there's a little breakdown in the stack up. <laughs> but uh, let's try to bring that junction temperature down to about 130. Let's put in about five watts. Thermal runaway, anyone? Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> and so I'm not, I don't have uh, a good value for the case temperature that I'd have to go through and uh, look at how I'm calculating that. But uh, we, I don't think we could get the case temperature up in this configuration to 125C and not have the package blow up. <laughs> so, uh, you know, there, there's limited use of these kind of tools and you have to dig through to find uh, the best way of assessing uh, <laughs> how these uh, numbers are stacking up. So the, uh, you know, just five times 20 is 100 degrees C rise. So the case temperature, let's click on the case temperature uh, down below again and look at, let's look at that calculation. So uh, I think it's, it's, it's not including the junction to case. Yeah, so what we'd have to do there is pull the uh, that blue window up to capture the 20. Okay. If you grab it from the corner, that little one of the corner dots, no, you can go right down to the blue. Yep, grab. Yep, there we go. That should do it. So go ahead and hit return. And now we're just going to get the same thing for the junction temperature. But this case temperature is what we want to target for uh, that 125C. So let's lower the 5 watts to, you know, 3 and see what we get. All right. So it's going to be a little bit more than 3 watts that he probably ran through it. And... Uh, he was measuring 125C. Okay. Now, back over to the calculator. So we've, we've got the, the vias defined. We've got one mil of uh, plating in the via. And so the calculation for a single via, if you move your cursor to the left just a little bit, and over in the gray area, you've got the single via R, that's, mm -hmm. the, that's the thermal resistance for a single via with the uh, one mil of plating in it. And then down below, I do a calculation to calculate what the uh, thermal resistance, because all of these thermal vias are uh, in parallel with each other. And so they all add up. So with six vias, that 217 watts with six vias, it goes drops the thermal resistance through the board to 36 degrees C per watt. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what, and so that's the basic calculation just for the thermal vias. Now, if so, I don't like to just neglect the board, the, the thermal resistance in the board. And I'm only using the thermal resistance of the dielectric material. You know, if you've got a bunch of copper planes, in the board uh, and, and other vias, there's going to be some kind of composite of the board material and the copper. But from for doing these kind of calculations, I like to be on the conservative side, and I don't uh, worry about those things. I just use the thermal conductivity of the board. And so if you look down and then to the right, there's one more red uh, area that two, so that two inches is that two square inches is the area of the board that I'm assuming that we've got uh, the thermal vias populated over. And the other part that I, I wanted to emphasize, you know, in a design like this, you want to have as much copper right underneath the packages as you can and spread the heat out as fast and as far away from the component as possible and tie your thermal vias into that copper right around the package as much as feasible. So if you uh, go up and, and change that uh, six vias, well, let's change the plating thickness first and look at how that changes the... Uh... Now, so I, I set that up as three mils. It, and, you know, that, that would... My concern with three mils would, would be that I might start closing out the via and trapping 
uh, chemistry inside the via. Would that be a concern of yours? Um, on the manufacturing side? Not so much now with pulse plating. Um, it, it certainly can be a concern, but I've also seen via samples where, you know, we close, I mean, we plate those things solid shut um, and you do the cross sections and they look clear. There's not a whole lot of voiding in there anymore like it used to be in earlier years. Um, so I, I would pretty much always, and I, of course, I, I would wanna get our process engineers um, confirming this so they don't beat me with a stick next time they see me, I would say you'd almost always want to increase your plating and get rid of the epoxy fill from a cost standpoint um, because we can do it so darn good now. Of course, aspect ratio comes into play. Uh, we've got some pretty high aspect ratios going on right now, um, but I think we could do one to 10 pretty reliably. Cool. So let's kick that up to three mils. Okay. Not like that. Ha ha. I broke your spreadsheet. There we go. Cool. Yeah. And so we, you know, you drop that thermal resistance through the vias, through six vias from 37 degrees C per watt down to 15 and a half degrees C per watt. And that's, that's a significant reduction. And now if we uh, bump that, the number of vias up to, let's do 30 first, since that's what that design has. Okay. Uh, and I've also got good news for viewers at home. I'm going to share this on screen real quick. Um, we now have this spreadsheet available for you at this address, I'm told. So cool. if you guys want to play around, play along at home, um, play along at home. Okay, I bumped that up to 30, Mike. All right. And let's go over to the, the calculations part. Let's point put the junction to case back at 0.9. And also uh, scroll down a little bit and let's change that calculation so it's not picking up for the case temperature. Let's set the case temperature back to the way it was. So if you just go down and set, yeah. Got it. Sweet. All right, now we're not cheating anymore. Now I'm learning. Cool. Cool. Good for all of us. <laughs> all right, so uh, I can't see the spreadsheet. Um, I see the Royal Circuit's emblem and stuff, but I can't oh, see the Oh, let me get rid of that. That should have been up long enough for it to show up in the chats now. Um, and then I can scroll yeah. up for you. How is that, sir? That looks good. Now, essentially, we should be simulating uh, his design, but, you know, you, you got to wonder about that 125C top case temperature and how this, you know, this configuration of a model, what, where the errors are. And what I like about something like this, so this would be in a, in a design where I'm working with, with a group of people and I'm part of the team. This would be one of the first things I do to kind of get a feel for things. And then I'd go off and start building a more detailed thermal model with a nice thermal modeling tool. And without that, people are, they're they're really stuck, and I I'll send a message out for Sven here. His uh, if he's an electrical engineering uh, group uh, or a department at the university, I highly recommend them teaming with the mechanical engineering department and getting one of their thermal people involved because both people will, will gain a lot from it, and they'll be able to have a higher success rate for the next spin that he makes on this design. Um, so let's dump, you know, let's go up and push that three Watts up to 15 Watts. Sorry. Um, here. Yep. Because I, you know, it, it's so hard to have all the disciplines under your belt, right? Yeah. It, I feel for, you know, there was a time period when I first started working that, uh, the groups that I was working in, they wanted to have the thermal analysts also be stress analysts. And mm -hmm. those are very, very, uh, it takes a lot of time to be good at either one of those disciplines. And to be good at both disciplines is a special individual. And I've, I know a few, but I wasn't one of them. <laughs> I, I, I did my best at 
doing stress analysis and I was able to come up to speed okay. But to try and, and meet the design uh, goals in terms of schedule to do both disciplines, you have to take shortcuts is really what it comes down to. And I, I, that's, I that's a tough world when you have to start taking a lot of shortcuts. I remember thermodynamics in college. Um, not that many people passed. I, I was quite happy with my B. Um, <laughs> a lot of super seniors taking that over and over again. It's it's complicated, and there's a lot to keep track of. And if you forget one thing, you could be done, depending on what that one thing is, of course. Yeah. So now let's scroll down a little bit more. So on the uh, let's look at the 60 watts. So on the left there, I've got 60 watts. I'm just looking at the temperature rise through the board. So we're just using that thermal resistance through the board to see what kind of a temperature rise we have uh, through the board. And I'm also including, you know, a junction temperature there. Uh, and let's see. I'm a little confused about that one. All right. That's okay. It's click thermodynamics. On the, click on the sum total. 1.7 okay. there. Uh, uh, the what, sum total here? Yeah. Let's see what that's looking at here. Okay. So it's just the 1.73 and that's just the board. So the case temperature and junction temperature don't mean anything there. It's just the temperature rise through the board is what we're looking at. So if you go down to case temperature, and you look at what that's looking at. Let's see, click up on top. Yeah, so it's just using, uh, you know, temperature above ambient, and it's just the temperature rise across the board with 60 watts. So the, uh, the goal here is just to see what the temperature rise across just the board is with a full power of 60 watts and try to see what you know some more vias would do to try and bring that delta t down 130 degrees c across the board is not going to be an acceptable temperature rise and you know fortunately with this these mosfets they've got a very small junction to case thermal resistance and so we really have to get what that what that mosfet's mounted to we need to get that temperature down and you know, there, at this point, there'd also be a lot of work looking at what kind of a heat sink is on the back of the board and how that's going to be mounted. But you know, for the point of talking about thermal vias, let's bump that thirty thermal vias up to a hundred. Wow. Okay. Yeah, a lot of your um, glass transition temperatures uh, for you know, if you go get a run of the mill cheap FR four, you know, you're looking at about one hundred forty. C. Uh, so if we've got 120 above 25, you're there. You're melting. You're decomposing your glass fibers. I mean, board's all floppy. <laughs> yeah, not a configuration you want to design to. No, floppy, floppy boards are out this year. Who knew? Yeah. <laughs> yeah so, you know, there, there's you're starting to get that delta T down, but you know, at some point, there's only so much you can do for the kind of power that is you know, trying to be designed to here. 60 watts is just a significant amount of power to design for. And they're, they're, by using a spreadsheet like this, I guess it just helps you uh, start thinking about where your bottlenecks are and you know, what you can do about it. So now you know, talking about thermal vias, I'd like to get back to what I was asking you. What's a practical, you know, I'm, both from your manufacturing background and your electrical background, Mark, uh, what's practical for getting a population of, say, 100 thermal vias at 10 mil diameter in a particular area? Well, it's in two square, I mean, in two square inches, it's doable. Um, you start running into upcharges though. Um, anytime that you have to do a, a drill hit, that drill can sometimes wander and twist. So you can't always stack them, you know, one next to the other. You've got to put a little bit of separation distance in. Um, 
I forget the exact number, but our small, okay, so let, let me back up a little bit. Typically, you don't want to have an aspect ratio greater than 10 to 1. So if we've got a 63 mil board, as you mentioned here, um, you know, our smallest drill hole would be 6.3 um, mil. They don't really come in that diameter. Uh, typically, the drills come in increments of 0 0.05 millimeters. But if you order a let's just stick with the Eng the English units for a minute, a 6.3 mil via hole, what we do then is we over drill it and then we plate it down to that size, right? So we're not gonna drill a 6.3 and then plate it down to a 4.2. We're gonna drill, you know, a seven mil and then plate it down to a, uh, a 6.3 um, or whatever the metric equivalents would be. I, I don't know them off the top of my thing. So you've got to keep those drills spaced at whatever your your manufacturer minimums are. I'm sure we could we could get, you know, a 10 by 10 and 2 inches without much difficulty. But my next question would be on the assembly side. Um, how much of the solder paste is going to start wicking down into those holes? Right? Um, if you leave open open via holes and you put solder paste on that it just capillary action plus gravity is just going to suck that solder in away from your part and you're going to end up with an air gap between your uh your pad and your 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 land pad and your part pad and air is an incredible insulator right great insulator um so then we're going to have to talk in a second about how you would coat those how you would cover them but i'm going back to something i remember uh, from, I want to say J standard 01, or it might be in 600 A, I don't remember. Um, but you can have as much as 50% voiding from land pad to part pad and still consider that part acceptable. What would that do to our thermal resistance, Mike? So explain that, that part one more time. Okay, so if you have a bunch of holes that the solder paste can wick into, you can get air voids between yeah. the part pad and the land pad. And as long as there's less than 50% voiding, so as long as there's a 50% connection between the land pad and the part pad, then we would call that acceptable from an assembly standpoint what would that do to our numbers on this worksheet? Wouldn't that? Well, the via for the thermal via or through... not for the thermal via, but for the, um, I guess that would be your case to board number would double it at least, wouldn't it? Well, the case to board number is based on the area of the package size itself. And he's got a, a thermal pad between the package and the board. So that would fill over all of the, any kind of interface, any kind of surface roughness or anything be, on the board side and between the board and the component just fills in all the gaps. I will bring up a graphic um, just to show you the people, what we're talking about. Um, so anyways, back to your question, can we drill the holes? Yeah, we can drill the holes. Um, but if you start doing this a lot, you know, and you're doing this over your whole panel, you could start looking at upcharges from your fabricator. Um, you know, more drills, more wear, uh, more wear, and, you know, they've got to replace them more often, more chance of breaking a drill off in the board, having to chuck the panel if they can't get it back out. There's a lot of considerations. I'm yeah, well, the other, the other concern that uh, I think about is the Swiss cheese effect that will occur in your yeah. big uh, copper conductors coming in to feed those fats. Uh, so that has to be managed as well. But yeah, you could start getting uh, barrel wall failures and all sorts of stuff. Yeah. But you got to get it thermally to where it needs to be to work. So <laughs> it's always a happy medium between all the different disciplines. So I mean, it seems then, what if we did a slightly larger diameter hole with more plating? Um, would that be one of, something you recommend? Well, that's the fun part. That's why the, the tools here for people to go in and make those kind of changes and see how that affects the end result. And then do more homework on some of those uh, areas that, you know, I, I don't know what the design has for numbers like the sink to air and the conduction through the sink. 
uh, put real numbers in and then just experiment with the number of vias and look at how the calculations are made so that you can make this a tool for yourself. All right, I'm gonna share a new screen with you. Um, going back to something I brought up, but I didn't really set down. Um, I don't have slides. Do I have to stop screen first and then share? Uh, window. Well, this is the window, but that's not the thing I want to show. There we go. All right. So here we're looking at a thermal pad on a, I don't want to count that, but it's a QFN package with a thermal pad in the middle. And if you look, all of the vias that are underneath here became sources for voiding. Right? Interesting. Um, that's incredibly common. The solder paste in that area will wick down into the holes, gases will come up, and you'll end up with voids um, around virtually every single one of them. Hmm. And like I said, if you have as much as 50% voiding, you know, right up until you get 49% voiding, that thing's still acceptable to go out the doors by IPC standards. So what do you do with those vias? Um, you can leave them open and really upset your assembly house. You can tint them, you know, close them off. You can plate them so that the hole's so small that the amount of solder paste that comes down is insignificant. Um, or you can look at some advanced assembly techniques, you know, like vapor phase reflow, vacuum vapor, vapor phase reflow, where we'll assemble your board in a light vacuum. So all that gas, all those gases, just, and then that just becomes a monolithic piece. Um, but then there's also, if you do have thermal vias under a package, I want to say it's IPC 70, God, I always forget these numbers, 7035 or 7096, I never remember. Um, but there's a new standard out that tells you how to place your thermal vias in a particular pattern with solder mask dams around the vias um, so that you don't have the problem of the solder paste, you know, wicking into that hole yeah so um that's good. interesting yeah Glad you the, and uh, of course all of those are cost adders any extra steps that you have to include in your manufacturing process right it is so yeah. if you leave it open you're going to have to rework more often than not um so that's why this i want to say it's 7093 is the is the the land patterns that we recommend because that's the cheapest way it's because you've already got solder mask on your board so just putting it in a particular pattern that's free cool. um as that's far good. as price goes and filling with epoxy epoxy fill is ridiculously expensive um so that's why we usually recommend increasing your plating first before you start looking at a thermal epoxy fill nice so yeah um, so and then I'd like, I'd like we've to got questions about... too. Um, I don't know how long you have, but did you want to hear a question or two? Sure. Okay. Um, and then I will bring up our slides while we're doing it. So the first question we have is from Mr. Daniel Beaker. What impact can you expect with conductive thermal fill? You know, I almost added that to the calculator because... We... The, the issue is that the thermal via fills typically do not have a very high thermal conductivity. And there, the addition, if you think about the volume of uh, the thermal via fill and what the thermal resistance through that little piece of, of fill looks like, especially if you've already plated up your, your vias. And uh, I've never seen a case yet to where the thermal via fill actually helps thermally. It, if you go, if you have to fill them, uh, that's fine. I'd go with the cheapest ones possible, but make sure you plate up. Just plating up is going to give the most value from a thermal perspective, and it'll do a lot more for the design. And I, I would love to get into an argument with the people with thermal via fills and go through that. <laughs> Oh, you want an argument? Daniel Beaker is here to play. He says a hundred vias in that space is not practical in any design. Now, that's agreed, in direct, agreed. in direct yeah. contrary, assumingly to what I said, where I, you asked if we could do it. 
I said we could do it. Yeah, it's a horrible idea. You can right. drive with your feet too. So Daniel Beaker, you're looking for an argument. I'm not going to give you one. You're right. <laughs> yeah, well, and that's the point of these first steps is to look at what's practical. If you need 100 thermal vias and it's not a doable thing, well, maybe we start looking at some other solutions. You know, how much copper can you add to that that stack up to help spread that heat out so you don't have this huge concentration of power and, and maybe spread those MOSFETs out if you can. And it brings up all these kind of questions that just get you down the road. All we wanted to do is look at the calculation of the thermal via here. And now the practical side, that's why we, we're bringing it up with Mark and, and throwing it out there. You know, there's first steps in the design, you know, and one first step in this particular case is can we do 60 watts of power on all these MOSFETs? And, the first look is, well, not very easy. And it's not a simple problem. It needs to be worked and uh, every, one step at a time. Yeah, um, we've got a few more. And then if you have time, we'll get back to the presentation. Does solder mask webbing to control pastry distribution during reflow make sense? What is the thermal conductivity of mask versus air void? Okay, um, great questions. So does it make sense? Yes, it does. And that's, I, I, hopefully somebody in the comments that knows the IPC standards off the top of their head can tell me which one, because I hate to keep saying the, the same number if it's wrong. But yes, that's what you're doing. Um, with the liquid solder masks, you know, we can do webbing down to two, three mils. As long as you have a solder dam, it repels the, the liquid solder paste and it can keep it in the areas that you want it to. So you want those solder dams around, you know, uh, vias in pads, vias near pads. You don't, you don't want that. Um, so, but the question is, what's the thermal conductivity of mask versus air? Do you happen to know those numbers off the top of your head? I don't. No, but I've got a general feel for them. You know, thermal conductivity air is about an order of magnitude worse than the dielectric materials. And, you know, solder mask is probably similar to the board dielectric materials, not orders of magnitude different or anything. So, you know, they're all... They're all poor conductors and air is, you know, a real poor conductor, uh, order of magnitude probably different than, than the thermal conductivity of, of the board dielectric materials. And thermal conductivity of board dielectric materials are in the order of what, about 0.4 watts per meter Kelvin? Yeah, 0.3. You know, I've got some numbers on, on the spreadsheet there that uh, I have, the numbers that I included are measured values that came from some of the work that we did with IPC 2152. We had polyimid boards and we had uh, two different FR4 boards. We had the thermal conductivity measured for each of them. And what you typically get for thermal properties with dielectric materials is the Z axis thermal conductivity. They don't go and measure the X and Y because you've got you know, different uh, materials that are making up the different boards and so you've got different size materials that are in the weave and so in the calculator if you go to that if you go to the right i think i included it on this page can you go way over to the right mark yeah yep. there you go sorry it's so just that, taking a second that table 1a 1b are our fr4 boards and the polyimid is the polyimid board and one of the differences there is that the thickness of the boards is a little different. Uh, I guess in, in these, they basically use the same, that's a little different. But the uh, coupons that were made, uh, those properties were all measured and that's what we were able to use when we started making our thermal models for uh, correlating with the data that went into IPC 2152. The other thing I wanted to, you know, touch on is that power calculator page, and and I know you didn't want to spend too much time on the uh, differences in in the electrical resistivity of copper, but I do like touching on it because that haunted me for two years. Uh, the the so if we look, this this calculator is again the red values are for input. Uh, so the input values are, are kind of over on the right in the L column. And all that this does is it calculates the power dissipation in an electrical trace. And it, it assumes that this is a perfect geometry. And so some of the values that go into that, one is the resistivity of copper. 
And the, the three values that are included up on the upper left there, the resistivity values, the first one comes from the CRC Handbook of Chemistry and Physics, which I thought would have been a great value for using to calculate the you know, thermal resistance in a copper trace. But it turns out that that's a very pure copper. And the next two values, and this it's a little strange at first, but uh, the first value there is for half ounce copper. And then the next one down is for one ounce copper and greater. And those values come out of uh, a particular test method, which is an IPC test method, 650, 2.5.4.1, and that's actually 0.1a. And those values were determined by measurement by the National Bureau of Standards back in the 50s when they did their original testing. And those values gave me just the most perfect uh, correlation when I was looking at uh, trace resistance. And when I was looking at trace resistance, I was also looking at the trace cross-sectional area. And these values gave me a, a, just a perfect, almost perfect correlation between the trace cross-sectional area, which we had cut up and measured uh, to, to our, so calculating and then measured, those values uh, gave us a very high uh, correlation between the test traces that we, we were working with when we were doing all the test data collection for IPC 2152. And I highly recommend those, those two values in there. And uh, the point here of this, this calculator is just to calculate the uh, power at a given temperature. So if you look at applying current to a trace, and if you look at measuring its resistance with just low current, uh, something where you're not really heating the trace, it'll have a certain resistance. Well, when you start kicking up the amperage and the trace starts to heat up, then the resistance changes and you have higher power at the you know, steady state temperature that you're at in, in its actual use. So if you have a board that it's operating at, you know, say 85 degrees C, which would be kind of an average board temperature for a lot of the designs that I used to work on, the, uh, it, it's important to assess what the power at temperature is at, you know, when it's under use and not just estimating power, you know, at a ambient temperature uh, for the trace. So uh, this calculator, you have to play around with a little bit, but it, all, it includes the trace length so right now it's set at you know a half an inch wide. If you look up at, at column L, half inch wide, it's five inches long. Uh, two ounce copper, I, I've got it set assuming that one ounce copper is uh, 1.35 mils. But my under, my experience is that copper, you know, one ounce copper is more like about 1.2 mills what well, maybe a little hmm. bit and uh you know if you look at the ipc minimums <laughs> trace uh thicknesses can be significantly lower and so it's worth playing around with the copper thickness a little bit and then uh this just calculates a a, a delta t for the uh using let's see there's an ambient if you click on that one click on that uh, 108 degrees C and then go. So, okay. So that's just hardwired in. Yeah. So it's just being used to calculate the change in power. That's where I would set that at maybe uh, 85 C and uh, see what the power for the trace would be, you know, if you're running high current. So this is not calculating temperatures. It's just calculating the power in the trace at temperature. And it looks like we're about two minutes out from close. So I just wanted to bring those things up and uh, let people play around with it. All right. Uh, do you have time for a couple more comments or questions? Sure. Okay. So uh, 
going back to before we, we came up, we were talking with Dan and he said, so there's no real good return on investment for thermal field, better to plate up. I would agree. I think I heard you say you would agree too, right? I, absolutely. Yeah. Um, unless, you know, unless you have to have it filled with something, uh, I would certainly plate up first and then follow up with whatever my manufacturer would recommend. Um, so Les is commenting on the IPC specs, uh, basically says, have a fill specified amount in the, okay, so you've got data sheets and this is something you'd wanna communicate over to your fabric, your assembler. Um, if you do have a hot part like that, specify that you require the higher fill amount. Um, they might require you to go to move from say convective uh, reflow to like a vapor phase. I mean, you can get like 90, 100% fill on that. Um, it looks like there's a conversation. What's this? There, it looks like there's a conversation happening in comments. Um, you really need to do several in parallel so you can have more surface area and lower power per device by more of, I don't know if I understand that one, Dan. I think that there's a separate conversation I'm missing. Um, we got thanks. Thank you, Les. And Daniel, thank you. Okay. So um, just to revisit everything, Mike, thank you so much for your, very much for your time. We have already posted your calculator at this web address. For those of you, you should have that in your comments, whether you're at LinkedIn or YouTube. This was our first time trying out a LinkedIn webinar. I don't know how it went on your end, but if you have any comments, let me know. And if, if it went well, we can actually move it over to the brand channels for the next one. Mike, you said you wanted to do this all again with your software. Well, I would like to go and talk about IPC 2152 okay. and technology specific design charts. And I can best do that through using some software that I developed back in the 2000, 2004 timeframe. It doesn't exist anymore except on my computer, but it would at least allow people to see, you know, a little bit more information about trace heating, what it really looks like and from the perspective of uh, board size, the influence of copper planes, and just be able to talk about that a little bit more than what you can find in IPC 2152. I'd and love to. Nice way to close out this whole little path that we've been on for a little bit here. You know, I've really enjoyed this path, Mike. I geek out on this stuff. It's been fun. So thank you so much for your time, everyone. Thank you to Mike Yopi. <laughs> Mike Jupy for helping us out. And uh, you know, once we figure out a time that works for Mike, um, we'll we'll set that up. We'll we'll do this all again. So thank you everyone. Have a great day. Bye. Bye, Mark.